Welcome, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be broadcasting live from the Health and MedTech Expo at South by Southwest, and I'm really pleased to have here today Eric Topol, uh, the famous cardiologist and author and Colbert uh, visitor, and uh, <laughs> uh, who I've known for a number of years, and um, so great to see uh, you here. Thanks, great to be with you, Clay, and a really exciting time for for uh, the, the new medical school and, and for your leadership. Oh well, thanks. Yeah, no, it's been it's been really exciting, a lot of fun. So, your the title of your of your new book, "The Patient Will See You Now." Yes. So I haven't read the book yet. I gotta admit that. But the oh my uh, gosh, you haven't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I will get I will get, get out there and get that. Um, but the um, but te I mean that's uh, so different, obviously, from the way it works today. Yeah. So how are we going to get to a future where? That's the reality. The patient will see you now. We're getting there, but it's um, happening, I think, more quickly than a lot of people realize. And that is because of the way that your smartphone becomes center stage. You have sensors that bring your data, like your electrocardiogram or your uh, eardrum or your uh, eye exam, all to your phone, processed by algorithms, diagnosis to you. And so you don't go to the doctor for the diagnosis or even the monitoring for blood pressure and glucose. It's all done with algorithms through your phone. And that sets off a whole new way of medicine that I don't think uh, people have been prepared for, happening really quickly now. Mm -hmm. So the devices are there. I mean, it's amazing. And around here, there are a whole bunch of companies starting up and trying to fill those spaces. But then the, where I worry about them is we throw them into this healthcare system that's still primarily based on a fee-for-service reimbursement model. So anything that, that produces efficiencies potentially lowers the reimbursement for, for yeah. a, an empowered entity within the organization. So how, how is that going to play out? Well, it's a big barrier because we're not willing to do what's best for patients and what's best for the national health care expenditures. Everybody's worried about reimbursement and their own little silo. And that's a real problem because we can really gut costs if we make some of these transformative changes. Uh, but in this country, it'll happen more slowly than it will in many other parts of the world. Hmm. Are we seeing that already in yes, the yes. British like, system? And well, uh, for example, the use of the, the modern stethoscope, which is a high-resolution ultrasound, yeah. is being used much more uh, rapidly uptake in India, Brazil, China, than it is in the United States. I mean. It, it, many log orders difference because there's no reimbursement issue there where there's a big reimbursement issue in this country. Right. Well, the, even though places like, well, Kaiser, you know, they get a fixed amount, cover their people. Why haven't organizations like that been more innovative in terms of embracing these sorts of technologies to well, change the way they provide care? Your point is a good one because they have been as much innovative as any health system. Yeah. They do have mobile uh, access for any member at Kaiser to get their uh, most almost all their information that w it makes it immediately accessible wherever they are. So in that regard, but they haven't been uh, even taking it further by the embracement of sensors and a lot of these digital tools, getting people sequenced. They're doing some research studies in genomics. So we could do much better. That's probably the best example we have of a progressive health system in the digital era, but it's, it's on a scale of 10, it's still maybe a three or yeah. four. Yeah, it's so interesting. Like they've been afraid maybe because they're still working within the same insurance. Yeah, I know. They, they, why would they ship, uh, uh, move all studies to home when they still get reimbursed by Medicare and other uh, uh, payers? So there's lots of resistance to these changes. Yeah. So as you as you know, and we were talking about just briefly, we're we're in a interesting position here of starting a brand new med school, um, and even have you know we part of why we exist here is the community actually voted to increase their property tax to bring us here. So also very unusual, and very linked to the community. So how should we take advantage of this opportunity? Well, it's uh, it's a fantastic one, and it's, it's great that you're leading the charge because you already have this kind of academic uh, environment here in Austin. And it's a time in medicine that there's probably no more significant change and challenge as right now. I mean, in the history of the medical profession, it's never been challenged as to its autonomy and as to the change from an analog to digital world and all these things, the patient uh, rising. So uh, I think to uh, support that, 
uh, having a new medical school that doesn't have to change curriculum is the ultimate uh, dream. So that each student learns how to practice telemedicine. Each student has their DNA sequenced and learns about not only their sequence, but about bioinformatic challenges of filtering all that big data, about you know, learning how to prescribe apps instead of um, medications in many cases, or how they complement each other. A lot of these things that uh, support a new, uh, not just empowered, but emancipated patient. And it, are there ways that we can structure how we work in terms of healthcare delivery and partnerships in the community to enable these kinds of changes to happen more quickly? Well, one thing would be, since the community backed this whole thing, is that why not set up a knowledge resource for the, all the citizens, where by you have one of the largest, uh, not just biobanks, but you know, physiologic data, the Google medical map of each person, uh, of the community available as for the next person with a particular condition. So it's a way to get out of this way that we practice medicine today, which is I'm gonna take care of you and all that stuff I learned from you is not gonna help anybody else because you're not gonna really get into some kind of research paper. Well, it turns out there's a lot of other ways to help people besides getting a publication. Uh, and that could be something that might be attractive uh, here in Texas. Uh -huh. So, so there it would be becoming that resource, I guess, and taking advantage of our trusted position in the community to do that? Exactly, exactly. And the ability to collate uh, very high quality data and integrate that data. Because you've got, I'm sure, one of the biggest parts of medicine going forward is high quality bioinformatics, biocomputing. You have that capability. And actually every medical student should learn, maybe not how to do that, but how to collaborate, get that stuff done. And you know, just those kind of pilot studies to get warmed up to something big, because eventually, someday, that'll be uh, transcontinental. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, but starting somewhere, you know, this could right. be a place where it starts. Yeah, yeah, so that's a, so it is not transcontinental. It should oh, be transcontinental. Yeah. I use the example of the, uh, the ATM, you know, when you put your, you know, at some point, banks didn't share information. Right, Because right. they'd, they'd steal their customers. It's a good example. Yeah, and that, but now your ATM card works in a variety of different machines. But how, how do we, are there ways that we can get that kind of revolution started on a local basis? Well, I think it takes a leadership. It takes a, a structure like yours, which has in, um, intrinsic agility to start it. it someone has to sh be the exemplar to this to get going. And I, I kind of thought of it spontaneously since you were asking about uh, a school that the, that the citizens of the community uh, set up. I mean, that's fantastic. It's un in so many ways unprecedented. I don't think there is a precedent. We've been looking for one, but yeah, we haven't I found think it. It's, yeah. I, I congratulate this. I mean, I, 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 me. I, I, I've was upgraded my yeah. perspective of Austin yeah. by doing such a thing. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's fantastic. But I, I, eventually there'll be coalescence of these. So, you know, if you do it and several, you lead the way, then others will follow suit. So you helped to start the med school at the Cleveland Clinic, yes. and a big part of that, um, what, 12 years ago? It, we, we, we got a thing, um, the big donation to start it in 2002, and we opened the first medical class came in 2004. And you were heavily focused on research as a big component of that, particularly right. clinical research. So other, other lessons from, from that experience? Well, uh, it's a very small medical school. And what was perhaps the biggest impact was uh, being tuition free. And so quickly, you know, unlike the University of Texas that has this kind of stellar reputation already, I mean, Cleveland Clinic didn't have that for, it had, never had a degree granting program. In fact, it still does, and it, that goes through Case Western. But uh, to attract the best students by taking the financial burden away, really uh, very quickly uh, started to bring in, and of course, the idea of nurturing uh, research pathway was somewhat unique at that time, and now, of course, it's more co more common. But we still don't have that many tuition-free medical schools. Yeah, we can't afford to be <laughs> tuition-free. I wish we could. We'll try to be tuition-free for a subset of, pay of our students, and, sure. and the tuitions here are are nice and low, yes, much lower than they were in uh, California. Yeah, yeah exactly. So a definite advantage. Um, well, I. Great pleasure having you here, yeah. and I really want to thank you for uh, for spending this time and uh, answering all these great questions. Any parting words well, for the, the only, audience? Well, the only parting words, I share the excitement with you for this new um, transformative medical school with mega potential, and congratulations on, on that, and I'll be following it closely with you. 
Well, thank you. And thank you very much for stopping by. Sure. All right.